Hey, uh, so the third speaker for the platform track uh, in this session is Rob, uh, Rob Dickinson. Uh, so Rob has a very, there he is, he's waving. How are you, Rob? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. Uh, look, I LinkedIn stalked you as well, my friend, and yes, a very deep technical history uh, behind you with uh, leadership roles at, at Intel, at Dell, Quest Software, and now I see you're uh, working as CEO and CTO and co-founder just to um, just to keep you on your toes of uh, Resurface Labs. Uh, you're in Colorado, is that right? Yes, in Boulder, Colorado. Good one. Oh, it's a good town. I've I've had a couple of beers at uh, Boulder, Colorado. It's a it's a pretty nice part of the world. So uh, my understanding, I'm sure you'll talk about it. Resurface Labs focusing on the monitoring observability. Maybe we just kind of bounced across that topic in the last talk. So uh, observability of API seems to be a very hot topic. Absolutely. You know, um, OWASP number ten all the way. Uh, right. Uh, sufficient <laughs> logging and monitoring. Is is really um, you know why I why I left my comfortable gig at uh, at Intel to uh, to do this company and um, you know most days that still seems like that was a, that was a good choice so yeah. it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. Well, you're doing well. If most days it seems like the right choice, you're doing better than most. Um, okay, well I think we're I can give you a push. It's over to you. Enjoy yourself. All right. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks, thanks so much for having me. Uh, so what we're going to be talking about today is this idea of shifting out of triage mode with a failing API. And that's because turnarounds can actually be fun. Um, a turnaround, for anyone who hasn't heard that term, is kind of the art of taking something that kind of sucks and is kind of failing and turning it into something that's actually vibrant and successful and, and doing well. And um, I've been lucky enough to have a long enough, uh, uh, long enough career in this industry to kind of see the, the sour and the sweet there. Um, love to hear from you on uh, Twitter and, uh, and online after the talk. Um, you know, just why do you care about me uh, and, and my opinions about this stuff? I'm a, I'm a deeply technical person at, at heart, uh, you know, self, self-taught coder got into technology in the in the 90s when everything was moving to web then we saw the last transitions you know everything moving to mobile everything moving to cloud now everything moving to api first architectures that means a lot of those projects are going to succeed a lot of projects a lot of those projects are going to fail and the ones that fail are really not as much fun um, but what we're going to talk about in this talk specifically is kind of the challenge of how do you deal with working on a project where things aren't going well? How do you turn that API around from something that feels like is, is draining you to something that becomes a canvas on which you can paint and, and build your business? So um, we'll talk a little bit about how that feels, how, how, you, know, how you might know if a, if a turnaround is right for you. Um, we'll also get into some specific coping strategies and some, some specific ideas about how to structure those programs. You know, a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about here today, it, it still fits with what you generally know about DevOps, what you generally know about iterative development, agile development, quality practices, security practices. But all of that stuff comes under intense pressure in this context where things aren't going well. And so that's really what we'll be what we'll be exploring. All right, so just to kind of set the stage here. Um, what do developers like most? They like starting from scratch, <laughs> like greenfield development. Um, you haven't made any mistakes yet. Everything's possible. Everything looks great. Everything's exciting. Um, this is a lot of fun. If you're doing startups, this is why a lot of people do them, is you, you get to start from scratch. You, you get to do these new initiatives. That's super fun when you get the opportunity to do it. However, what if you aren't there from the start? What if you're joining a project or you're spinning up a new API, you're, you know, but, you're, but you're not necessarily there from the start, you're inheriting something or you're taking something over. So this could be you're going to a new employer. Um, new employer brings you on, you're the API expert. We need your, we need your help. Um, we've, we've got some problems that we have to fix. 
It could be moving within the organization. It could be moving to a new team, could be getting promoted, could be an acquisition or a merger. You're, you're putting multiple teams together. It could be you're taking something back from a vendor. That's a, that's a story that we hear a lot. Um, it could also just be kind of a, a directional or strategic change. And in any of these cases, you know, you're, you're, you have something that already exists and you have to move forward with that. And more often than not, this is the situation that you're in in your career is you're, you're taking something over, you're contributing to something that already exists. And that brings some of these unique qualities and, and dynamics that you don't really see when, when you're starting from scratch. So all of these are ways of saying, you know, you, you, you didn't make every decision. You weren't involved in everything. Um, and, and unfortunately, things aren't going well. And sometimes you know that almost immediately. You join a project, you join a new group, and it's like at the first lunch or by the end of the first week, um, you, you, it's pretty obvious already that, that things are bad. Um, and, and my sympathies, if you're in that situation right now, um, there are other more subtler signs that a turnaround is needed. And, and let's take just a second to define what we mean by that term. A turnaround is really, uh, an official act where you say, we've got to do something different. We need to restructure our technology. We need to change our roadmap. We need to change our priorities. We need to pay down some of our technical debt, but we simply can't keep going the way that we're going because things aren't going well. It feels like this API is, is failing on us. We're not, we're not really getting where we need to go. Now, what are some of the code smells that kind of go with this? Because sometimes you're not exactly sure um, if, if, if things are really going well or, or maybe they're not. Um, some obvious signs to be looking for, if it feels like your customers are doing your QA for you and your customers aren't happy about that <laughs> and things aren't going well, that's that's a bad sign. You might need to turn around. If you have just in general a high rate of defects, if you seem to fix things and they immediately come back, that's that's a problem. Um, if no one on the team can make very reliable predictions about how the system is supposed to work or how it will work, given different circumstances, that's a pretty bad code smell. So that can come out as as random behaviors. That can also come out as as excessive complexity. Just too many layers, too many things going wrong. You could have performance problems is another very, very frequent um, symptom of things not going well. Um, you can also have issues as you bring on more people or as you try to change roles. Um, as people shift off the project, come on. One of the things to remember about a, a failing API and a turnaround is it can be hard to add people to that. Sometimes you have people leaving. And just those people leaving actually makes the, the turnaround harder to achieve. So this idea of, of people leaving and taking those repeatable processes with them is incredibly damaging um, if, if, you, if you get on the, on the backside of that. Um, another really classic sign, unstable builds, operational issues in production, failed migrations, failed upgrades. These are all confidence busters in the end, right? And now you may be looking at this list and say, well, you know, doesn't every project have that? Of course, right? Every project, uh, except for ones that are you know, the most mature, um, will have maybe some of these at, to some degree. But what we're really talking about, where this, these signs really lure, lean towards that a turnaround is really needed, is like the volume. It's that these are systemic problems. This is way beyond your normal tech debt, um, way beyond the normal, you know, we're moving a million miles an hour, kilometers an hour. And so, you know, of course, we're, we're breaking things because we're changing things super fast. Um, a turnaround is really, it, it, just, it just feels untenable to keep going the, the way that you're going. And kind of the emotional way <laughs> that this comes across is it feels horrible. It doesn't feel good. Nobody enjoys this when this is going on. You, you, you can smell it in the air. You know things aren't going well. And, you're, and a lot of people, especially the people who aren't in the senior leadership positions, are going to start to look around and say, is somebody going to do something? Who's going to do something? 
what are we going to do? Um, and you immediately get into this triage mode. We've we've just we've got to do something. I, I need to get some sleep. I need to clear these bugs. I got to make this customer happy. Um, I've got to do something. And my favorite part about this GIF here with uh, with Homer Simpson is Homer has the classic developer response, which is I've got to do something. Let's start rewriting. <laughs> it's very natural to think that um, because you've got all these other all these problems that you're trying to figure out, and and that's where our brains will will naturally go as coders. It's very logical. It's not necessarily the most helpful um, response to have. So that's what we're going to get into more is now that you know that you're now that you know that things are bad, you know what those code smells are. Um, what are the the practices that you can start to put in place to crawl out of this triage mode and get back to to firm ground again? It is very easy in how this feels in the moment just to thrash and by by thrashing i mean trying to work harder just trying to put in more hours taking more weekends asking people not to take vacations um trying to throw more contractors at the problem um, these are all examples of how you can thrash and it's easy to actually make things worse in this case because again people aren't happy and if people don't see signs of a turnaround, they will start to vote with their feet, and um, and it'll be even even that much harder to to turn this back into a, a success. So, part of the way to frame, um, uh, I really like the concept of anti patterns, and so one of the things I wanted to start with, so I'll give you a couple anti patterns here about ways that you can kind of immediately sabotage your turnaround. So these would be things you, you really don't want to do if you want your turnaround to be successful. So we'll go through this, this short list, and then I've got uh, just a couple more slides that go into some very, very specific techniques that you can use to structure your turnaround. But let's start with this list of things that might feel natural um, to do, but in the end are, are really going to damage or sabotage your turnaround. The absolute first thing that you have to do to have a successful turnaround is to be as precise as possible about what the goals are that you're trying to reach. And then what are the metrics that you can establish around how to measure progress to those goals? You cannot skip this step and start writing code. You cannot skip this step and start re-architecting or pivot your go-to-market positioning or whatever else that is that you need to do to, to get this under control. You have to really step back and say, what is not working here? And if it's performance, if, if performance isn't working or scalability isn't working, just as an example, and that's what's holding us back, what is the performance level that we have to get to? Or what is the scale that we have to get to? What is the scale that we're at now? How can we measure that along the way and make sure that we're moving towards the right goals? If the goals are more on the business side, we're not getting enough customers, we're not getting enough signups, we're not getting enough sales at, at bottom of funnel. Again, specifying those clear goals. What is the problem that you're actually trying to solve? It, I know in the moment, you're thrashing and it feels stupid to almost like sit back and go, yeah, of all the things that are going badly right now, what's what's really the goal statement that we should set um, about what that what that better world would look like, that better version of the project would look like? You've got to start with this. Um, the thing that you can follow then immediately is correct assumptions about your customers and use cases. If you go into your turnaround guessing, um, one of the ways that you see this a, a turnaround will fail is that um, you make the same decisions the second time around as you did the first time for the same reasons without really any new information. It's a very classic way to fail with a turnaround. This is actually the time to question everything. Question all of your assumptions. Question who are the most the, the the customers who are the most important. What are the use cases for those customers that are the most important? Make sure that you're laser focused. Your goals 
ideally should be again specific to those customers specific to those use cases your metrics should reflect those but again this is the time to question everything you know things aren't going well um, nobody's going to hold it against you um, another anti-pattern though is and it's easy to fall into this trap um, especially if you were on the team that built the original thing the thing that's not going well um, maybe you contributed to, to some of those some of those factors you can't be defensive. You also can't create a culture where all you do is blame the team that comes before. Um, that doesn't work. <laughs> That's it's uh, it, sometimes it can be politically expedient, but it, it doesn't it doesn't help anything. Um, what it does is it creates a culture where people are afraid to volunteer. They're afraid to take a risk. They're afraid to make a creative suggestion. And you you really don't want that. So even though and, it, and it's tough in this context, you're trying to do a turnaround, you're talking about the things that aren't working, and that can come across as blame sometimes, but you, you have to temper that. Don't blame the people, um, classify the behaviors. Again, keep those goals and metrics as your North Star. That's what you're trying to get to, and, and you reset on that and, and not blame. Um, you have to really watch the, park, the politics um, bargaining can be just a really, really damaging anti-pattern. Bargaining is where you say, well, if we do this on this area, we'll all agree to do this in this area. And again, you, you should have a clear statement about your goals and metrics. Those goals and metrics, if they're really clear, you shouldn't have to be doing a lot of bargaining about what they really mean. Um, and you shouldn't have to be doing a lot of politicking about who supports what aspect of that get get clear and get your get your stakeholders in place um some classic ways to blow this up, so those are more cultural things classic ways to blow this up on the technology um switch languages platforms just switch everything especially move to something that you haven't used before chase that resume tech that you haven't used but you think it might be helpful in the future or looks really sexy um uh learning the code base as refactoring the code base as your first step I know there are coders who love that approach. This is not the time to do this. Um, refactoring a healthy code base is completely different than refactoring a code base that is failing. Um, and you, you have to recognize the difference. Um, you, you want to mentally be able to rethink kind of everything, but you can't actually sign up to change everything. So knowing that there are all these landmines out there, what are the specific techniques that we can use in just a couple of minutes that actually let us cut through some of this noise to identify, um, and all these things, by the way, are all symptoms of not having complete time, resources, or commitment. So how do we get to that place where we really can commit to the success of this thing? First part is improving the culture and improving the vibe. This sounds counterintuitive, because you're you're about to make a whole bunch of changes but what you actually want to start with is documenting what you have before you change everything and it's it's hard to get time and effort put towards that sometime because you want to be in that triage mode and to step back from that and say well how does this stuff actually work like let's actually get this written down it can it can be hard to to feel like you you get the time for that this is the time also to fill any monitoring or logging gaps that you have. Um, that's where companies like Resurface can help. Um, whatever observability problems you have are going to be magnified um, by the fact that you, you need to know where to focus. What are the things that are going well? Where are your failures? Where do they live? As you have that observability, now you can actually rely on those real customer patterns. This should tie back to those metrics that you've established. You should already be able to, to establish so, some of those metrics towards those goals. What we can do then very, very quickly by doing this is it, it lets you get into a posture where instead of thinking about everything that you could possibly change, what instead what you want to do is focus in on what are the smallest changes that will have the biggest impact towards your project. And mentally, this puts you in a completely different place because it puts you in the place now of focusing on what really works well. And you may also discover that things are actually working a little better than you thought. One example is 
you might have always had problems pushing things to production. You document that process better. You realize there weren't really as many bad steps in that as you thought, and it becomes more repeatable. You can immediately switch to focus on works well. You want to double down on what works well. The more that you do that, immediately your vibe is going to change. People are going to see, wow, we're actually going to do something about this. And we can take some small steps that are actually going to show us some meaningful returns right away. Um, observability and monitoring in general, being able to measure towards those trends, at least know how far away you are. All of these things are going to give you that confidence. And then you can start to see the feedback. You can start to see how those things are starting to pay off. Um, completely changes the vibe right away. If you're going to get into improving your tech stack, now is probably the time to be doing that. Uh, some things to be thinking about, sharpen your tools. Um, one of the classic things is if you have anybody on your team complaining that they don't have the hardware that they need to get what they need done, or they don't have the tools that they need to get like all those tools or that hardware, it's cheaper than the people. Just go get it. Buy the good laptops. Now's when you need people working more and get them excited. Like it, it's a cheap upgrade. CICD, got to have it. If there's anything that's not repeatable about that part of your process, now's the time to actually put that in place. Test automation gaps for the same reason. Again, I realize some of these things are going to feel counterintuitive. Because you're going to feel like, well, why am I writing all these tests if things aren't going badly and we're trying to change all this stuff? Now is when you actually need the tests more than ever. And you, you need this kind of basic tool sharpening more than you need to start changing everything about how your technology works, especially if you have any gaps in any of your automation here. Production runbooks deploy, uh, you know, um, the next thing that you can get to very specifically, very tactically, work on cloning your environments. You should be able to set up a personal environment, a staging environment, a copy of your production environment. The more you can clone your environments, and that's not a bespoke thing. Um, there's, in my experience anyway, there's usually not a huge appetite for chaos testing if things aren't going well. If things aren't going well, the last thing you're going to do is start running around and breaking stuff on purpose. But you can get a lot of uh, a lot of mileage out of chaos testing if you're doing it against clones of your environment. So really work towards that. What this is going to do then, this is going to give you a tempo. It's going to give you, you, you can do your builds more frequently. You can do your deployments more frequently. Um, you can benchmark more frequently. You can break things more frequently. That's going to build that tempo. Last, uh, last specific tactical advice here. Products and projects that are failing often have big security problems that have been neglected at the same time. Don't forget about those problems. This is actually where you want to uh, dig in on that stuff at all. Poor security often tails all these other issues that we've talked about. Now is when you want to bring in those better security practices, including your scans, your reviews, your vulnerability checks. Your actual scanning in production is, is a big part of this a security champions program. Anything that you skip around security right now, it, it has the, the potential to really blow up everything else that you're doing about your turnaround. Um, so don't don't cut this one short. Um, it's uh, it's really, really bad if you do. With those things in mind, with those specific techniques in mind, if you if you are in a situation where you're dealing with the turnaround and you're and you are in triage mode, it can actually be be fun. You can actually use these techniques. I've done this a number of times where it feels like something that's just going to be awful actually turns out to be one of the best experiences that you have that you ever have and and the way that you build a culture and team around that can can really be second to none and uh love to hear i know we've got some questions in the chat and always always uh up to talk talk about this more on on twitter and online <laughs> one of the questions is it, is it a fail whale <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw that that that's from our, yeah, our own Mr. Kaganoff. 
<laughs> yeah, it's funny. Um, when we were looking at names, I know this came up in the last talk. Uh, when we were coming up with names and we were looking for available names, we kind of stumbled across Resurface. And I just had this mental flash of uh, a whale jumping out of the water. And it's like, that's what I want to do. I like want to capture all this data and I want to bring it up where people can see it and just make this huge splash and, and really change things. Um, sometimes it is a fail whale. <laughs> you know, <laughs> failure is a part of all this. You have to be you have to be willing to fail. You have to be willing to, to put yourself out there. So the that troublemaker Saul actually has a, a more legitimate question that I'll I'll read. So many many people are trying to save time and money by leaving automation until later. Um, Saul thinks that's counterproductive. What are your thoughts? You know, I, I have seen I have seen both sides of that. I have seen the folks that they completely skip automation. Um, sometimes at really early stage companies, that can be the right thing because you don't even know what you're building yet. And you really need the ability just to toss what you have and, and start over, do something new. Um, but, but the quicker you can put that test automation in place. Um, I mean, I think about test automation as far as like tests that I don't personally have to run. Um, and I'm a big, and I'm a big fan of like having that, that automated QA. Um, I don't think there is a one size fits all answer. I mean, I know I'll drive the test, the test driven development people crazy in saying that, um, you know, you, you have to pick, you have to pick the right thing and, and the right, the right timing there. Uh, mm -hmm. I think a lot of it is stage of life, how confident you are in, in, in what you're doing and, and how much of that you think is going to change. Also, it's yeah, how hard is that automation? I, you know, depending on the system, that automation could be really easy and it really feels like you're skipping something by not doing it, or it could legit be super hard and, and it's actually a better use of dollars to, do, to, to limp along manually for a while. Um, yeah, you gotta, gotta feel it out. Happy to, happy to talk through a scenario if, if anyone wants to, wants to talk in more detail. Well, I mean, Rob, you mentioned dollars. Um, that's one of the things that I'd be curious to ask you because in these uh, environments, you do, I completely agree that devs like building things and that beautiful picture of a greenfield, you know, that's kind of Nirvana for, for engineers. Engineers build things. Um, and so often when they kind of join a peloton, they grizzle and roll their eyes and say, oh, I could have done that better and let's reinvent things. So you've got people who are making decisions, people who actually hold the budget, the purse strings, and they're hearing these noisy developers who are complaining and developers, you know, we all like to complain. But then you've got this mindset about, oh, well, we've spent a fortune on this thing and we have this platform and I thought it was going to be great. Can we squeeze value out of that for another couple of years? How do you kind of balance when you're hearing in stereo noisy developers versus, you know, the realities of running a commercial enterprise? Uh, so I, uh, the question almost makes me wish I'd, I'd put that in as an anti-pattern, but you, you, you can't do any of that by fiat. You know, you, you can't do that by your, your management team saying, we're going to convince you that this is, you know, this is what we need to do. We need to save the company. We need to make more money. We need to, um, right. I mean, for all those reasons that you mentioned, it, it just, it, it's not personally motivating. So, what I've found in the turnaround projects and, and kind of some of the other transformative projects that, that I've led, the, the easy answer is the hard answer, which is you have to win over every single person that's involved with this effort. Like the, the way that you really build that momentum, um, you know, every developer, they have something new they'd like to learn. They have something that they've done traditionally that they might not want to do anymore. Or they want to hand off to something else. They might want to move into a new role, or but if if you, if you can really tap into that, and and have that as a sidecar, and say, you know, we're running this, you know, the larger context is we're running this turnaround. We're going to save this project, and you're going to be a better engineer on the AP, you know, at the end of it. You're going to learn this thing that you always wanted to learn, and this is going to be the opportunity to do that. And you're not just going to have to go to a new company to get that experience. You know, a lot of times we just vote with our feet in order to get what we really want. Um, if you really can win everyone over on an individual by individual basis, um, everyone will carry their own water. 
and and you that's how you build that peloton right the the peloton is such a perfect example because the peloton can go so much faster than any of those individual riders on on their own um it's being able to feed off that that energy of the group um and and you you can't just do that by having one person at the back going we got to go faster we got to go faster yeah you need people at the front leading you need people supporting you need you know you, you need your domestiques you need you need everything in a bike race <laughs> yeah the the peloton analogy is a good one actually and i think you know you mentioned in your talk uh, a lack of clear goals and metrics as being like the killer um, often these debates are settled and, you know, people calm down when you start putting kind of an analytical lens over things and say, all right, well, let's put numbers against this this instinct, this feeling that we all have to, to really to, to quantify what are we talking about here? Because it, often when you do that, the things that you get passionate about become maybe less important and it shines a light on other areas that you might have not been focusing on. It's so true. We we are all data heads, and um, and we all prefer the empirical approach. And all of the worst drama that I've seen, all of the most emotionally tense moments that I've had in in my career, they've all been cases where you didn't have the data that you really needed to make the decision. And instead of having the data. You're substituting your fears, prior experience from prior companies, and all these other things that aren't necessarily related to what's actually going on. And I just and I just couldn't agree more. And I know it sounds very self-serving as an observability vendor to say that, but but I really have seen that, you know, with, with my own eyes. When when you go from that, when you go from that sense that like you know that things are wrong, you know that things are slow, you know that things are breaking to actually know what's slow, what's breaking, by how much, how often, who's affected, it, it lifts that, that fear away. You, you can start to, um, you, you can start to diminish some of the emotional timbre of that. And, and nobody, you know, you can, you, can, you can disagree about the data or the interpretation of it or wish you had more, but the data is such a great rally point, especially when things aren't going well. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I think uh, data, um, you know, r diminishes the arguments and it gives us all kind of a shared, we can all yell at the data instead of yelling at, it, at each other. That's right. Uh, well, thank you, Rob. Uh, we really appreciate you coming on board. We, we're out of time. Uh, we need to let people run off and, and in our part of the world. They're probably going to be having lunch. But thank you very much for being part of uh, API Days Australia. Um, everyone, please uh, feel free to reach out to Rob uh, on the chat or through LinkedIn, and um, it'd be good to, to keep connected.